I did. How are you doing? They've come to the wrong place. <laughs> we might say that. Uh, but I'm the doing well. Place. It's good to see you. We, we, it's been a two-week gap, so I was feeling seriously deprived. I'm glad we're back in, back in our rightful or perhaps wrongful position. Me too. It's awesome to be back. Uh, I want to start with some politics, man. Start a little heavy, and then we'll probably end with some pop culture, fun stuff, what I've been watching, uh, what you've been up to. Um, but we, I think we have to start. If we're ostensibly going to do any rank punditry here, we have to yes. start with, with politics. Um, since you and I spoke, uh, Donald Trump gave this speech about abortion, um, and he talked about his his position. Um, and I'm just going to play a little snippet of that right now. My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both. And whatever they decide must be the law of the land, in this case, the law of the state. Many states will be different. Many will have a different number of weeks, or some will have more conservative than others, and that's what they will be. At the end of the day, this is all about the will of the people. You must follow your heart or, in many cases, your religion or your faith. Do what's right for your family and do what's right for yourself. Do what's right for your children. Do what's right for our country and vote. So important to vote. So he's obviously all over the place. Do what's right for yourself. Pro-choice. <laughs> states' rights. Um, gobbledygook. Some states will choose more conservative. It's hard to tell what he's saying, but... I Guy, I thought initially that this was a pretty brilliant um, thing that Trump was doing, right? That that if Ted Cruz or Ron DeSantis were the nominee, that abortion, you could use abortion against them, but that Trump, because he's staking out this kind of moderate turf, send it back to the states, that it was brilliant. And then Arizona, the Arizona Supreme yes. Court announced that they, uh, that in 1864, Law would be uh, the law of the land, at least for now, which essentially bans all abortions except for the life of the mother. Um, I've got thoughts. I've got clips. But first, what would you think? Well, the ending of that speech is remarkably airy and empty, even by Trump's standards. It really is impressive how weaselly he managed to be there while still at least giving a, 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 pati a vague patina of coherence to what he was saying. But you can't, naturally there's outrage, but nothing about what he had to say in those remarks is remotely surprising because Trump has always been utilitarian. He's always been shrewd. And because he doesn't actually care about policy, he's always seen major policy debates and major culture war debates just as a means to an end of preserving his own continuation and his own, his own popularity personality cult over anything actual, actually substantial in terms of good politics or what may morally be right to the country or may morally be right to the law. So with this, it it's a natural... Trump in 2016, Trump had no choice but to be pro-life and to, but to put up a facade of being pro-life because we were in an intense time with Scalia's death the prospect of what a Hillary to what what a Hillary's election could mean for the Supreme Court could mean for the social, America's social landscape could mean if you're if you're a religious if you're religiously inclined what it could have meant for religious life in the United States now but and quickly he enjoyed a lot of victories as a on the basis of that now the politics on the ground are different and Trump very clearly would just like this issue to go away he knows he can't avoid it. He knows that the GOP has backed itself into a corner because it hasn't been able to stake out a coherent kind of position or a broad sort of party-wide mandate for what it wants to do in the aftermath of Dobbs. So he would rather, and he also knows that if he's going to win, he needs to appeal to disaffected moderates rather than hardline social conservatives and evangelical voters. So his approach naturally is to stick to the middle ground and in doing so, we wish this all away in a weaselly fashion so he can get back to ranting about the border and about Biden's aid. 
but it didn't work. And like I said, I thought that this was a shrewd political move. It would be hard to cast Trump as a crazy right winger. He's not Mike Johnson. He's not Ron DeSantis. Hell, he's probably paid for abortions himself, most people think. <laughs> um, but this is not good for Republicans. Um, and now Republicans are in this weird position of having to say, let's get rid of the pro-life bill. It's too <laughs> radical. It's too pro-life. And Trump's not the only one concerned. Let me uh, go to the next clip left are so desperate attacking Trump now for an Arizona Supreme Court ruling that upholds what is a Civil War era law banning abortion. This will be fixed in the next week or two. Let not your heart be troubled. I can I can pretty much assure that that will happen. Trump opposes the law and this ruling, or you can believe Joe's make pretend Donald Trump that doesn't exist. And you know what? Arizona's governor is a Democrat. The state's attorney general is a Democrat. The state legislature is almost evenly divided. If Democrats, you want to get rid of the law, well, you have a chance right now to get rid of it. And I would advise you, get rid of it. They would rather use it as a political tool ahead of November. All right, so this reminds me a lot of the Republicans who could have gotten rid of the border problem, but they would rather use it as a political tool in November. Will Democrats use this as a political tool? Um, look, I think that the the Arizona Democratic Attorney General made a huge mistake. She said that she would not prosecute women who have anybody who performs or people who have abortions. Uh, that's a mistake. Number one, your job as attorney general is to <laughs> enforce the law, whether it's a good law or a bad law. So I just think philosophically, that's an abdication of your responsibility. But secondly, that makes it much less of an issue. If she's not going to enforce it, then why, then why is this an urgent big deal? Um, but look, as you know, Guy, Arizona is an important swing state. Um, this is going to be a, a, a big deal. Now, now, Democrats, I think, are going to have on the ballot in November, rather than fix this, because why do the Republicans work for them? Democrats are going to have something on the ballot in November. I think that dry, as long as what they put on the ballot is not crazy, like abortion on demand, partial birth abortion or late term, whatever, as long as they come up with something close to row, I think this maybe swings the election to, to Joe Biden in Arizona. I think it's certainly possible. I think a challenge for both sides on this, much like with the gun control debate, is that voters and public opinion doesn't really value uh, internal co logical coherence on this <laughs> issue or philosophical and intellectual consistency on this issue. Because if, if, you, were to, in, if you were to boil it down, very simplistically, surely the abortion debate would not be an especially complicated one, right? Either abortion is murder or it isn't, and the law should reflect that accordingly. But of course, life is complicated. We live in the real world, and people have complicated lives within the real world. And so it, you can't expect them to think about it that way. And reality doesn't operate in that way. So what that means is that what people expect from the law and expect from politicians is difficult for politicians to really live up to and to figure out a coherent way of responding to and dealing with. But the Democrats, as opposed to the Republicans, at least have figured more or less figured out a way to formulate some kind of coherent position. And it, in the night uh, under Clinton, that position may have been safe, legal, and rare. Now it's shout your abortion, but at least we know where the Democrats stand in the culture war on this. Republicans, and I think especially the pro-life movement, given all that's happened since Dobbs was overturned, are stuck between a rock and a hard place because if they endorse sweeping bland, if they try to endorse sweeping statewide bans on abortion and advocate those and work toward those in elections, that isn't going to play well because the majority of people don't support them. But at the same time, if Republicans... <laughs> If Republicans endorse partial bans and try to gradually sort of chip away at abortion in that way, that's probably the better and more pragmatic tool, but it doesn't really align with the pro-life position, and it certainly doesn't align with the social, socially conservative and religious end of the Republican base. Yeah, and Republicans, I think, are the dog that caught the car on this one. I mean, the yes. IVF, 
the IVF thing down in Alabama, they were able to fix pretty quickly because they control everything in Alabama. Um, they don't control everything in Arizona. So you're going to have this problem where trying to change this, you're going to have some hardcore pro-lifers who aren't going to want to water down the 1864 law. And then you're going to have Democrats who are not going to cooperate and who probably don't want to give them a win. So um, this could affect the presidential race, uh, but not just that, a key Senate race. Let me go to the next clip. There is no clearer example of how toxic this issue is and this ruling is for Republicans, particularly within the state of Arizona, than Carrie Lake, the Arizona Republican Senate candidate yesterday, came out strongly against Arizona's Supreme Court ruling. She wrote in part, I am the only woman and mother in this race. I understand the fear and anxiety of pregnancy and the joy of motherhood. I oppose today's ruling, and I'm calling on Katie Hobbs and the state legislature to come up with an immediate common sense solution that Arizonans can support. Well, that is not what Carrie Lake was saying just two years ago when she was running for governor, promising to support whatever the state Supreme Court decided. I don't believe in abortion. I think the older law is going to take a, is going to go into effect. That's what I believe will happen. Okay. I don't think abortion pills should be legal. We have a great law in the books right now. If that happens, uh, we will be a state where we will not be taking the lives of our unborn anymore. I'm incredibly thrilled that we are going to have a great law that's already on the books. So it will prohibit abortion in Arizona, and I think we're going to be paving the way and setting course for other states to follow. So that, was, of course, was uh, Willie Geist on Morning Joe. But I, look, you tell me, Guy, but that, it seems like they've got her dead to right. I mean, it seems like she owns this issue now. And um, I just don't, I mean, who knows, anything's possible, but it would seem to me to be very hard to extricate herself from her past comments. Yes. Oh, well, and there's a clear case in point to what we just spoke about. There's a clear example of reality slamming someone in the face on this and getting in the way of what their principles may. Who knows with Carrie Lake, but if Carrie Lake does truly believe that abortion is murder and would like to see abortion outlawed, she now knows she can't say that if she wants to retain office and if she wants Donald Trump and the MAGA wing of the party to be successful in the next election. But I don't I don't think I don't think the hypocrisy angle will ultimately amount to very much or will is will really occupy much space in the minds of voters when what voters are actually animated by is if they feel like this is a fundamental right or an important right and it's being stripped away from them and that the Republican Party wants to stand against, that's going to be <laughs> that's going to be far more significant in the coming months. So I think Lake, in this much like Trump, is ultimately being shrewd about this and a potential good play for Republicans in taking this to the Democrats and trying to find middle ground with the Democrats while also setting the Democrats up to shoot themselves in the foot would be to propose instead of the kind of sweeping broad blanket abortion bans that we've talked about, uh, tr suggesting more mod uh, relatively more moderate restrictions that voters tend to agree with, polling indicates that um, in, uh, polling indicates that acceptance of abortion restrictions corresponds with the uh, lateness of the pregnancy. If Lake and the other Republicans in Arizona, the, Republic, the, Republican, legisl the Republican legislature in Arizona could propose something like a, a 15 to 16 week ban while keeping exceptions for the rape exception, the incest exception, the same things Trump spoke, Trump spoke about in his speech. They're putting, they're forcing Republicans, to, they're forcing Democrats to either accept that or to reject it, in which case the Democrats are giving them ammunition to say, look, the Democrats are evil. The Democrats want to kill children. They want abortion past the point of birth. And it, that could play well for them. However, will that actually work out? And will this not just be a disaster? I am <laughs> skeptical, as I imagine you are, Matt. And look, I mean, I think we would both agree that uh, this is an important issue. People feel strongly about it. It's a life or death issue. Um, but we do rank political punditry here. So that's what we were doing. And, and I, I think it's a fascinating turn of events that has happened just in the past week.
And I do think the state of Arizona uh, has probably swung from maybe leaning Trump to leaning Biden now, and, and it could be a U.S. Senate seat uh, involved as well. So major political development here. I think that um, it, the Republicans are the dog that caught the car. Let's see if Democrats overplay their hand or how they maneuver from here. But I think Democrats have an opportunity to make this a, a winning issue for them in November, certainly in the state of Arizona. We will keep an eye on that. Meanwhile, Guy, I have to say, there was a clip of Donald Trump. Did you see this? Donald Trump visiting a Chick-fil-A. I actually missed this. And when okay. you mentioned it to me, I thought I would wait and save the surprise because I can only imagine what you're about to show me. Well, and believe it or not, I kind of found this endearing in a in a weird, you know, Trump has, he's childish, but he's also childlike. And there's a childlike winsome quality that I sometimes <laughs> find cute, um, sort of like a baby, a toddler even. Um, let's go to the clip. So here he is. It's at a fast food restaurants in Georgia. Uh, it looked like the people behind the counter, young African-American women. They seem maybe just starstruck, but they seem to have a good rapport with Trump. And uh, later I saw there were some pictures being taken with some of the employees, things like that. I do wonder if, if Trump ever paid for the milkshakes because he has a habit of ordering drinks for everyone and then never paying. <laughs> yes. um, and but overall, that's just it's a small thing. But it struck me as the kind of thing that it's hard to fear him when you see him doing that. It's hard to hate him when you see him doing that. It's just great PR. And it seems like Trump is probably better at this than Biden is at this point. Clips like that remind me why I came to this country, Matt, because that is contemporary Americana at its absolute, <laughs> at its peak level of earnestness, simultaneously at its peak of earnestness and strangeness. Pre president, former President Donald Trump, who may soon be reelected, walked into a Chick fil A and celebrated the Lord's Chicken. That is something we could not have written 10 years ago. Although um, although Bill Clinton did used to jog to McDonald's restaurants, so yes. anything's possible. Not, well, the Lord, the, not the Lord's chicken there. That's the thing. It is a sort of throwback to the old good old, bo the old, good old boy style of Bill Clinton politics from the 90s that we don't see very much anymore because things are often so vituperative now in in the media and in how, and especially, especially as far as Donald Trump is concerned and in terms of the chaos that perpetually surrounds Trump. Really watching that clip, I'm just reminded of the moment during his first term when he catered uh, Domino's and McDonald's and Burger King and other fast food for the, football, the winning football team during the government shutdown, which was remains one of the, one of the highlights of my life, watching, <laughs> watching the video footage of that. Well, if Trump wants to get elected or get reelected or whatever we're saying, uh, less talk about dictator for a day, more Chick-fil-A is my advice. Um, all right, it's guys, also, you... It also bears noting quickly that if you remember the Atlantic, the recent Atlantic piece about the New York Times, Matt, uh, progressives, you know, progressives see Chick-fil-A as evil and yeah. see the spicy chicken sandwich from Chick-fil-A as not a real sandwich. So... I start clapping. I start snapping my fingers when people talk about Chick-fil-A. <laughs> this, this, this is a brilliant way on Trump's part of sticking it to them while also appealing to being a man of the people. It's inspired. For those who think I'm going crazy, wasn't it in the story in The Atlantic that uh, when uh, this conservative 
New York Times staffer said he liked Chick-fil-A. They started snapping their fingers? I, I believe that is correct. Yes. Uh, unless we is, both. And I'm not sure what that even means because I'm not woke, but it's not good, I think. <laughs> um, How dare did, a man like a sandwich, Matt? He must be <laughs> he must be removed from public life. I like I love Chick-fil-A. Um, what I don't like is staring at the sun during an eclipse like Trump did. Did you uh, did you see the eclipse guy? I saw part of it, um, but I know that with my luck, I would have gone blind if even with glasses, I tried looking at it for more than a couple of seconds. So I only briefly got a look. But yes, I did from the, um, from a rooftop here in here in Washington. And it was it was wonderful. It is an amazing sight. It sounds like you're like me. I don't trust those glasses. I'm not going to like I'm not going to do anything to potentially damage my eyes just to see. And by the way, I saw pictures like Jonah Goldberg took a really cool picture from yeah. wherever he, he was. And I saw it was great. I, I like the picture. I don't need to look at the sun through glasses that may or may not actually protect my eyes. It was I was my thought process, too. I got a couple of seconds with the glasses on. I was like, OK, that's enough. I, yeah, I can leave that. My myopia is bad enough, but I certainly don't want to exacerbate my vision problems unnecessarily. I think staring at screens for 12 hours a day has done enough harm. I don't want to compound that with looking at an eclipse. I guess I'm a glasses truther. I'm not sure what I am, but uh, but what I'm not is a conspiracy theorist like some of the people. I don't know if you saw this guy, but so like after the Baltimore Bridge collapse, there were all these conspiracies. It was DEI. <laughs> it was terrorism, you know, immediately, yes. mostly right wingers, I think, but probably everybody, I mean, across the board. But it's, the people I saw were of the right uh, had these theories and the eclipse spawned some craziness, <laughs> too. I'm going to show you a clip. I wish I don't remember this guy's name, but he is a right wing journalist who is apparently Marjorie Taylor Greene's boyfriend. Here we go. I want you guys to have a fantastic weekend, and here's why. This might be the last normal weekend that we have for quite some time. I mean, we've got this solar eclipse on Monday, this very rare solar eclipse. Who knows what the fallout from that will be? Plus, that will be combined with several earthquakes. We've already seen a few already. And why not uh, sprinkle in this infestation of locusts uh, that have been dormant for years and all of a sudden will attack mankind so why not oh then throw in joe biden trying to get into a war with iran for whatever reason he wants to do that so on that note have a great weekend i oh, have a great weekend after all that pestilence frogs falling from the sky it's not even really a conspiracy theory it's like a warning that the apocalypse is near it's more of a collection of mythological references than anything else. I'm not quite sure how you describe Batman's diatribe. There. But no, that, I had the same reaction. I liked that he ended it on such a pleasant and an optimistic note. That was courteous of it. But have a great weekend, everybody. <laughs> you may not yeah. make it, but good Lord willing. Um, exactly. The rapture is approaching, but until then, have a good spring. I'm not sure. Are you pre-trib, post-trib, millennia, millennialinarian? I'm not sure. Uh, but whatever the case may be, I'm still here. So apparently the eclipse was not the end times. Uh, we made it. We survived. But not everyone, Guy Denton, has survived. Uh, the juice, O.J. Simpson, uh, I'd I would say he will be missed, but not by everybody. Um, O.J. Simpson. Yeah. Uh, so I, I have a little clip. I'm not, it's not a long clip. It's a little clip from CNN. And I just pulled this for you guy, because number one, you're young. Uh, and number two, you have not been in America very long. So I'm not sure how much you know about OJ's oeuvre, not just OJ, who allegedly murdered Nicole yes. Brown. But here we go. Uh, watch this clip. The trial made lawyers and even witnesses household names. Orenthal James Simpson not guilty of the crime of murder. When the jury freed Simpson, celebration erupted in parts of Los Angeles. But Simpson would never recapture his idol status. Simpson first sprinted into the national spotlight as the Heisman Trophy winning running back at the University of Southern California. 
then 11 spectacular years with the NFL vaulted him to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Simpson cashed in on the popularity, becoming a pitch man for Hertz and an actor, becoming well known for the Naked Gun movies. O.J. Simpson, as you've never seen him before. Simpson played a lawman on screen and ran into trouble with the courts off screen. He lost the multi-million dollar wrongful death suit brought by the families of his ex-wife and Ron Goldman, then moved to Florida. In 2000, Simpson was accused of assault in a road rage incident in Miami. He was found not guilty. In 2005, he was found guilty and fined for stealing satellite television. Then in 2007 in Las Vegas, police arrested him on several felony charges, including kidnapping and armed robbery. It was an interesting life to say the least, but you know, the part that I find and still find amazing is like this guy was a star football player in college and in the NFL. And then he was a movie star and he did TV commercials. It would be almost as crazy as like if a famous actor killed Abraham Lincoln. You know what I mean? Like right. it's a, it would be like, I, I, don't, I can't even, I don't want to even throw out a hypothetical, but like it was shocking that OJ was being ch arrested and was running away from the police it was just insane at the time. You probably weren't born. I was not. But do you remember where you were when the, the car chase happened, Matt, or what your reaction to all of the big media coverage was? Funny you should ask that question, because this is very telling, both of my misspent youth yes. and, and of what, what life was like before the internet and before phones. So I was at Ocean City, Maryland for senior week when this <laughs> happened. And I talked, you know, I called my dad one day and he was like, you know, you heard, you know about OJ, right? And like, this happened like two or three days earlier. I was completely clueless. My dad, I'm like, OJ Simpson killed his wife, what? I, I I never watched the, the car chase, the Bronco thing, didn't hear about it for days. It's unbelievable. I can't imagine in today's world. Now, granted, I was pretty inebriated 24-7 <laughs> for, for most of that time. Um, the wild and, days in Ocean City, right? God, tr have you been to Ocean City, Maryland, Guy? I, I have, actually. It's yes. not Kiowa Island. <laughs> it's not Martha's Vineyard. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's not Palm Beach. Um, it, it's a different place. And it probably was even more uh, blue color back back when I went. But um, no phone, no iPhones, no Twitter, different world. But yeah, crazy, crazy. I mean, that's what I was going to say. The most fascinating thing to me about looking looking back at the trial and the media uh, circus that surrounded the trial and everything is it's such a such an interesting window into how far we've drifted away from from monoculture and in how insular culture has become for people now because we so rarely see um is my is, is my thing all right i just saw a message you're good as far as i know okay yeah uh cut around that we so it's fascinating because we so rarely enjoy Moments like that in American life that maybe enjoy is the wrong word for a police chase leading up to the trial <laughs> of the fame of a celebrity murdering his wife. But nonetheless, moments like that where everything stops and everyone in the country is fixated on one thing and invested in one thing at any given moment, they don't really happen anymore outside of the Super Bowl, presidential elections, and the Oscars. And I think this would happen, though, if if I'm trying to think of, a, of someone who would be analogous, if Tom Brady, well, he's probably too big. But if someone of O.J. stature um, allegedly murdered his wife and then led you know, police in a slow speed chase with a gun attempting to flee to Mexico or whatever, um, I feel like. Everyone would be watching and probably live streamed on Twitter and Facebook. And and you would find out about it. People could text you. I would have probably been watching as opposed to being at the pool or the ocean or eating crabs or whatever. God forbid, whatever I might have been doing uh, back in. What was it? 1994. Um, 
you know, rooting for the Republican revolution. Uh, I think maybe more people would watch nowadays, but just in different ways. But overall, I think you're totally right about, about the, uh, the monoculture and, and, and the common culture being lost. But in something like this, I think people would flock to watch. No, I think you do have a good point. And imagine, I I remember here, I have heard stories from people who lived in Los Angeles while that was happening and had jobs in, in media and entertainment, who while the police chase was going on, or while the trial was going on, abandoned their jobs and just left the <laughs> office to try to to try to find where it was happening or try to wait outside of OJ's house for him to come back so they'd be there live to see it. And nowadays, no, you're absolutely right. With the advent of smartphones and social media and live streaming, imagine imagine if say, you know, think think of who the true the truly transcended stars of entertainment are in American life today. They definitely, uh, in terms of movie stars or pop stars or star athletes, there definitely aren't as many of them as there were in the nineties. Again, because of how culture has shifted. But it, imagine, if, imagine with the movies. If say, if say Tom Cruise got a, did committed some sort of heinous crime and got into yeah. a police chase, I think you're absolutely right. And it would be a really funny point of comparison for b- between now and then if something like that were to happen again and how people would react to it. All right, I want to, uh, in a minute here, I want to get talk about some of the movies and shows and music I've been listening to uh, and have you do the same. But first, Guy, I was promised two weeks ago that you were going to bring a story of going to WrestleMania. And so I want to, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you've got maybe some pictures, some video, uh, some stories. How, how was, did Hawkamania run wild, brother, uh, for you at WrestleMania? You know, Matt, I've let you down, I've let myself down, and I've let the wrong stuff down. You've let this whole damn show down. I've let the whole enterprise of wrongness down. Uh, Wrongomania is running wild, I'm not sure if that quite works. (laughs) Uh, But nonetheless, I did not go, Uh, and it was tragic. Um, We were all set up to go, but I, I was only going to go if the two or three friends who I was planning it with were willing to go with me. And one of them, apparently, because it took it took place in Philadelphia last weekend, and apparently the weather was not good. It was cold and drizzly, and that sort of dampened the mood a bit in the run up to it initially. And a friend of mine who lives in Florida, who I was going to go with, had a big obligation coming up this weekend that he was paranoid about getting sick for and missing out, getting sick and missing out on, or whatever. So he said, "Well, it's a lot of money," which is true. Tickets, the ticket prices were absolutely obscene even by the standards of a big event like that. Uh, it's a lot of money. I don't know if I really want to. We can just do something else that's equally stupid and uh, ignominious for me in a public I'm forum sure like this. Possible. Uh, well, I, again, I get the origin of our dynamic does come from Kiss Cruises, Matt. So the, remarkably, in, in this wild country of ours, I think it might be possible. Uh, I know it is a very high bar to clear, but hopefully... Hopefully, if it is a if that bar can be cleared and I can do something equally equally humiliating, the listeners of this show will be the first to know, and it will be discussed in granular detail. All right, we may have to raise some money. Uh, go to patreoncom slash Matt Lewis. <laughs> yeah. Help support this show and maybe send Guy to something even more ridiculous, and then uh, he'll be on assignment uh, and he can report back on his goings on. Uh, let me talk a little bit about what I've been watching, and, and I'll have you do the same. Uh, but have you seen? So there is a new Netflix series called Ripley, which is yeah, like the talented Mister Ripley, but it's different, and it is in black and white. And I'm on uh, I'm I've, I'm on episode four right now. No, I read about it the other day. I haven't watched it. I I do love the Matt Damon movie. I have a sort of strange fascination with it and i know a lot of people who feel the same way i would like to see it i've heard there's a i've heard it's very there's a lot of artistry behind it and um well beautifully it's... shot i mean it's black yes. and white the cinematography is great uh, again i'm only like not even halfway through it uh but you know matt damon's character who's like you know this con artist who who pretends to be uh, impersonates people back in the before the internet, back in the time at a time when you, you know, I don't think you could make this a 21st century movie, right? It has to yeah. be in the olden days. But Matt Damon's character 
had uh, a likability and a panache and uh, that made him attractive and charming and, and made you like him and trust him. Yes. This character, Ripley, doesn't have that. He looks and acts like a serial killer the whole time. So I don't, my, my biggest criticism right now is I'm not sure that Dickie or anybody <laughs> else would trust him and invite him to just crash at your place. <laughs> this is a totally unlikable character that seems like a, a serial killer. Does it follow the plot of of the Matt Damon movie and the original novel, or does it does it deviate? Is it still set in Italy and everything? Is it still about the Princeton connection yep. and all that? It it is. I would say, I don't want to spoil it yes. yet because it's still new. But I will say it's loosely based on the movie. Well, it's actually the movie's based on a book, so I've never read the book, so I don't know which one is is truer to life. I can tell you at this point. I like the movie better, but yeah. I'm still enjoying the series, partly because what we talked about, just it's, it's beautifully shot. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm also watching Almost Done. I think I've got one more episode to go uh, of um, Manhunt about John Wilkes Booth and very high. It's on Apple TV. I highly recommend that. The book is fabulous, but the movie yes. The series is good. Um, and my wife and I are watching Regime, the Kate Winslet uh, HBO show, which is uh, basically about this woman who, damn these emojis. Let me see if I could turn this thing off. <laughs> they keep popping up. Um, oh, Riverside really later. likes Kate Winslet, apparently. I don't know why that popped up then. <laughs> oh, I, I, it, I've gone this whole show and without this happening, and I say <laughs> yeah. Kate Winslet. Nothing happened. Okay. Um, Kate Winslet is good, and she basically plays, I don't know, a female Victor Orban is the best I could describe oh, it. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Like, I don't know if you've seen The Great starring Elle Fanning, or uh, there's kind of a whole genre now of of, of this, but uh, it's good. Um, and then lastly, I would say, I just started listening to the new Vampire Weekend album, which I guess is appropriate for a person of my age yes. um big fan of them in general not yet sold on the new album anyway that's me how about you guy what are you up to how does the new album sound because i haven't heard a vampire weekend album in a very long time i think it's been a few years since they dropped an album uh it's not a banger as the kids say uh, i'm still trying to digest it um it, it's 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 not as like melodic as as the stuff that i like it, it's it's perhaps even weirder i don't know like some techno sounds even i'm not like a music aficionado uh in that regard even though i used to play in rock bands i don't know much about uh you know reviewing it or talking about it but the thing about them i would say is sometimes their music grows on me so i'm i'm kind of hoping that uh that it will cuz i love some of their other stuff um for me, I well actually, have you seen Shogun? I haven't, but I'm interested. If, if curious, if you have the new Netflix samurai series, no, I, I just bought my son who loves Japan. He's into anime, um, and and he's a big fan of this show abroad in Japan. I just bought him the book Shogun, and I think in the '70s maybe there was a big mini series or something that was super popular. But I know there's a new show. I've not yet watched it. Okay, interesting. I've heard it's excellent. I've heard a lot of acclaim directed toward, toward it, like with the Ripley show, so I was curious. Um, one thing I... This, I have a funny thing I would like to actually uh, give some props to. I haven't... There are, there are almost no good movies out right now. There's very little to see. I'd like to see um, Civil War at some point, but I don't have especially high expectations for it, and I haven't really been watching much TV. However, I did see... Uh, last weekend, and in keeping with music, uh, music nerds listening, or people who are fans of funk and soul and R&B, 70s stuff, as I very much am, will probably appreciate this. There is a great play that is being taken around the East, taken along the East Coast right now, all about the life of Rick James. 
uh, which is based on Rick James's autobiography, his unfinished autobiography and his memoirs. It's called Super Freak, the Rick James story. I thought you were going to uh, say it's titled Cocaine's a Hell of a Drug. It should have been. <laughs> <laughs> there are many other type, more appropriate titles I don't think they could have gotten away with. But it's it's very funny. And I saw it in Washington. I think it started in Buffalo, where Rick James was born. And I, I, my assumption would be that they just they couldn't get it on Broadway. Broadway didn't think it was a big enough deal or or maybe a good enough script. But it's it's in Washington right now. I think it's going to New York this weekend. And then they're taking it to a few other East Coast cities. It's about three hours long. It's really, really good. Um, this musician and performer Stokely plays Rick James. He's hilarious and he sounds just like him. And the second half, the second act is more is what you'd expect. A lot of music, a lot of a lot of dance and performance, celebrating that end of Rick James's life and career. But the first half, uh, even though there's comedy included in it, and it's paced uh, mostly paced well. The first half is very dramatic and very serious, and there's a lot of information in it that I didn't know about his early life and how he struggled to get famous and stuck with music through his 20s, even though he wasn't really having much success until he finally made it and where a lot of his influences came from and how he wanted to be remembered and influenced other people. It's very enjoyable, and I've always... and I. I like a lot of Rick James's songs anyway, so it's a lot of fun. I recommend looking I recommend checking it out if anyone is on the East Coast and curious. Cool. I, I heard that there's a Huey Lewis musical now too. I saw something in the New York Times on that. I didn't know this. Is that right? Maybe this is where you go on assignment. <laughs> <laughs> in the name of this show, if if we could set up crowdfunding, I would go and watch the Huey Lewis musical and feedback. <laughs> Maybe the bulwark could fund that. That that could, you know, I mean, I know they've got deep pockets compared to compared to the wrong the wrong stuff. You know, we're we're barely making a million a year with our Patreon. They're, I mean, the, the right needs identity in today's political landscape, Matt. And what better play? What better thing is would would there be for us to rally around if not a Huey Lewis stage play? If nothing will return the power of love, it would be that. I, it's, um, a thing. it's a new drug, you might say. It's hip to be square, but you know what time it is, my friend. It is now cold gin time, so we're going to have to go uh, party all night, rock and roll. What, what's the line? Rock and roll all night and some party at something something all day, right? Party every day. All right. Uh, until next time. Always a pleasure to be as well, Matt. See you next week. See you soon. If you like what you heard here today, please make sure to follow the show, subscribe to the show, leave a like, review the show wherever you get your podcast, and also please smash that like button or whatever the people my age are saying. I don't know. I am a Kiss fan after all. But nonetheless, you can also follow us on X at at wrongstuffpod or drop us a note uh, fawning praise or scornful disdain, we accept both at the wrong stuff pod, all one word, at, g- at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening. We're looking forward to next time.